Okay, um, so I just want to introduce those who they don't know. Ahmed Gadir from the United States and Asim Qureshi from the United Kingdom. Also known as NATO. The alt NATO. Um, the tour NATO? Yeah, okay. We'll take that too. Yeah, thank you so much for uh, joining us for this uh, last session, the closing conversation with the scholars. Um, at this conference. Let's give all the scholars and contributors a big round of applause. Um, of course, it's a packed house here on the stage from edge to edge. And um, we're going to kind of keep this conversational, but also uh, more rapid. So, you know, you already had your chance to your 20 minutes. So don't take another 20 minutes. Just you know, keep your answers short. We'll try to keep you know our our questions also short. Uh, my name is Ahmed Bedir. I'm uh, from the United States. I want to start with Farid because I guess you have a claim to catch. Um, what brought you to this kind of work and why are you focusing on Islamophobia? You can be in academics about anything else. Um, why did you choose this work and why do you continue to uh, to work on it? He has one. Um, yes. Um, why did I choose it? Um, I mean, that was back at a time when I was still doing my PhD thesis. And since I'm a trained uh, political scientist, uh, what, what was interesting for me uh, was that Islamophobia in, in a domestic political sense, uh, in the sense of political uh, competition of party politics, entered the country where I come from, Austria, very late. Uh, which is similar actually to the United States, I would argue, uh, in terms not of structural racism, but in, in terms of on this Islamophobia as a political campaigning of political parties. Um, and since it entered the stage quite late, I realized then still being a PhD student that nobody would really want to talk about it, right? So you have all these political scientists with all their expertise on anti-Semitism, which has a long tradition in Austria, and uh, people speaking about racism in general, but nearly nobody really tackling the issue. Nearly nobody speaking out that there is a specific anti-Muslim racism that is going on here. And that was the initial reason why I entered in the, into this field, and at that time, I mean, even I would argue that nobody would even use the word Islamophobia, right? It was just absent from the public space. So it was on one side trying to create a discussion uh, to, I, in 2007, uh, 10, I established the Islamophobia Studies Yearbook as actually the first uh, journal focusing on Islamophobia. I think Hatem started in 2012, when it was the Islamophobia Studies Journal. Uh, that was, for me, important because <clears throat> I wanted to, give, uh, to create institutions where it is not only about me as a person who does this kind of work, but rather it is a group of critical scholars who are engaged in a discussion about what is going on today. And then what followed, what maybe many of you know here is the project uh, which is also sponsored by uh, the Think Tank Center, where our colleague Khaled is also part of, uh, the European Islamophobia Report, where we brought this to a European level. Uh, it's less academic in a narrow sense. It's more about, uh, again, doing a discussion on a European level, trying to also bring supranational institutions to talk about Islamophobia and to push all those things of anti-racist movements um, on a domestic and on a supranational level so that they take care of this issue. Thank you. Uh, awesome. Uh, no, thank 
Um, Varsha, um, most of us live in liberal democracies, uh, and of course there is a claim that India is a democracy too, right? Uh, yes, the eye roll suited that perfectly. Um, aren't you scared of doing this work? Because I think, I don't know if I could be as brave as I am living in the UK doing this work uh, as, I, as you are doing it in India. So yeah, I'd like to know your, you know, your thoughts about that. Yeah, that is a question. Sometimes I ask myself, am I scared? So uh, how am I doing with some days? I do that. I just sit and think like, what is it going to end day? But then even Shireen here was talking to me. She asked me, um, how is this going to hurt you? Is it already hurting you? Are there chances of you being targeted? So I said, yeah, I already know. Uh, my tenure, it's most probably never going to happen, or something like that. But um, when you resolve uh, about it from a faith perspective, I think that's that's all taken care of uh, from that sense. But then, yes, recently there was a time when I thought, okay, I should be um, maybe not so openly uh, critical of the government. But then there are moments. There was, as I recently said, there was a case of love jihad in Kerala, quote unquote love jihad. And the case had uh, a, a, a woman who had converted to Islam and who was being um, uh, tried by her family to be brought back into Hinduism. A case was registered that she was brainwashed by different organizations. But then she fought it because, uh, as you all know, uh, a court is not always subject. Uh, it's not objective. It's who the judges also matters. So first she was um, left to do as she chose. But then what we saw was um, she married a Muslim because that was the most probable way of getting out of this uh, parents looking after her. And then we saw a witch hunt. It was like the guy was being named a terrorist. The organization he belonged to was being called a terrorist. And she was, her marriage was revoked by the high court, saying it was not valid because it was done according to Islamic laws. So that marriage cannot be accepted as a marriage wherein it is. It is accepted. But in this case, they said it cannot be accepted. And she was sent into house arrest. Into house arrest not by uh, a Hindutva government, but by a liberal government. It is the left uh, Democratic Party ruling the state of Kerala. So it was their police standing guard, 20, 25 police every day standing guard at that house wherein not a single press person was allowed to talk to this woman and ask, how do you feel, or what is it that you have to say? At that point, when it, when it escalated so much, we came to the streets, and I had to be there on the forefront of it. So I was thinking, at certain points, you just try to do what needs to be done. If you cannot just say, I'm scared, so how do I do this? You just be there. Well, that's, that's how it's happening. I like that publicly, you know, because I think we all appreciate here that there is a risk, you know, so uh, I think it's... Now, Sadiq, uh, the chef, welcome. Coming on from uh, California. There's a lot of uh, Islamophobia studies, conferences, um, now more than ever before. Is that helping? Um, and you see that the uh, Islamophobia, is it rising or is it decreasing? Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> I think Islamophobia has always been there. Yeah. Uh, it's increasing at time because it's a political vehicle for uh, uh, mediocre politicians uh, to distract people from actual failure in the political and, and societal drama. Uh, 
uh, and also because I think that democratization of uh, means of communication it seems to us it's more. But I think from my own work in the field that I discovered that there is so much allies that actually supporting the right of Muslims to reclaim their own narrative and to join a different type of a struggle. So uh, in this sense, uh, you know, there is a positive flip side to this, that Islamophobia, the rise of Islamophobia and white nationalism in the United States in particular, allow us to do so much work that we are, weren't able to do it before. And the other uh, positive pieces allow the second generation Muslim parents and second generation Muslims actually to claim their own identity and narrative. And this is so important because they are self-empowering themselves. And that's uh, something is not being given, but it's taken. Uh, and in this sense, uh, one of the things that when, uh, when I started working in 2011 in this field, I came from a completely different field of work. Uh, I'm a researcher in monitoring corporate behavior. Uh, but I saw that the most uh, uh, fundamental aspects of our public and civil lives uh, being hijacked by uh, some of our community themselves try to uh, assimilate in a project that not necessarily conducive to our soul. So in a sense, is rising in some particular places, but not necessarily is more than ever before. Thank you. Uh, please, my name is Lee, so it's a little bit of a concentrated new for a little bit. Um, it's very interrogating. How difficult is it to operate within academia in a subject matter area that is already so racialized and as a Muslim who study that particular area too? Because it seems to be like layers upon layers upon layers of problems. Can you tell us a little bit about your experience or what the environment? Well, I, I, one time I, I met some folks from Britain and I, I told the guy, like, you know, all this Islamophobia stuff that I'm doing is actually a hobby. So I've never been doing it really as a work. It was also always like beyond the 40 hours of your normal research that you do at the university dedicated to certain projects, lecturing, whatever. So um, I think it took a while. I mean, I've never thought about it like this, but if I imagine I started in 2007, 8 with all of this kind of work, and maybe until 2016, I never really got a single euro for any kind of this work, right? So it was for a long time really like you're investing, investing, and it's more of an idealist project. So I think this is, when it comes to Islamophobia, still all of the work on Islamophobia that I'm paid for is in the States, it's not in Europe, right? So people in Europe, they don't want to really do some research on that and fund this kind of work. Um, so this is, I think, one side. The other side is, um, I think if, if it would not be for an American, sort of American professor at my department, I think there is generally speaking, very little space for POC. So um, I think it's it's like when you go when you go yeah when you go to an African American studies a, a conference in the United States, all the people are black, right? When you go to an African American studies conference in Europe, all the people are white. So the perception of what it means as a scholar to be part of a discourse. Um, it's very different in Europe compared to other places in the world. So obviously, from the beginning, they are suspicious if Muslim people doing scholarship on Muslims, because they, they, they have this kind of allegation that you are following a certain agenda, you, you want to support your, your people, or whatever. So I think in Europe, other than in the United States, I suppose it's uh, much more difficult. But it's a necessity that we have to go through at the same time, right? Going, uh, thank you. Going from uh, people of color to white people, which is, uh, are you part of it? Yeah, I got to get it. Let's give a round of applause for uh, <laughs> Salim. Nice to walk with a bang. So uh, while, while you all uh, thank uh, Farid, I'd like to um, 
Welcome, Dr. James Carr, who's joining us uh, up here. So he's from the Department of Sociology uh, in, at the University of Limerick in Ireland. He's also a consultant with the OSCE, Office for Democratic Institutions and Human Rights, and he's an expert on Islamophobia and education, somebody that uh, is like I'm familiar with. Uh, I'm not sure. Yes, exactly. As I was saying, we're going from uh, people of color to uh, the uh, white person. You were the only white person on the panel until you got reinforcement. And who are you? And it's yourself. <laughs> you're a minority here. Sorry, could he just pass me color? <laughs> now you're get prepared. So, not to, uh, you know racialize anything here, but um, I mean, as a person who is, in, I guess, in the United States, part of the majority white population, why are you interested in Islamophobia? And um, you know, are you, you know, the exception that you seem to get it right, where so many of your colleagues in academia get it wrong when it comes to uh, Islam and Muslims and the Muslim world? I think it's all forms of structural racism, nobody gets it right. Um, that it's not, it's not a knowledge you possess through experience. It's not a knowledge that you, ex that you possess through will. It's not even a knowledge that you can adequately possess through learning. It is these structures are so embedded and so complex and so continually shifting in their articulation that I don't think I ever get it right, but I struggle. And, um, and I struggle for awesome reason in, in an interesting way. It is, um, it is belief. It is the claim of some to superiority over others that I find unendurable. And, um, and so it doesn't, I have to admit, I am, I'm somewhat, but would you say, I move around a lot on this. That is to say, I've worked on African American racism, I've worked on feminism. I'm, I'm really not particular about which sub subject group I'm, I'm working on, and I just hope to be a good ally and to learn. Um, I do also think, perhaps, that I just, it, is not, it is not accidental I'm looking around, um, because I grew up in part in context in which I was the only whatever it was, the only white person, the only woman in the room. And so, uh, it is on the one hand a familiar situation for me and one that I don't find particularly troubling. Um, but what if my, what if my neighbor said to me, do you realize we're going to be a minority race soon? And I said, that's fine. <laughs> really, we're not afraid? And I was surprised that someone would fear that. And I still am surprised that someone would fear that. So, I, but I like that Awesome's formulation. I really do think that it is that that fundamental claim to superiority over others on the basis of some fiction of blood or skin or culture that is unendurable to me. This is a this is a bit of a hard question, Dr. Sandy. I have to bring you into this. Uh, I will start. Um, I want to ask you, you know, as somebody that, at his position while fighting his own legal case, I admire so much. Were there moments for you where you found it difficult to do the right thing? Uh, and how did you overcome that? Before the trial or after the trial? Yeah, during the trial. Were there any moments that I found it hard? Yeah. <laughs> to do, to, 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 because there was this constant debate, right, going on about you know, your own personal liberty versus the wider, bigger issues and trying to fill up the entire Do you mean, is there are any moments where I regretted what I have done? Sorry? Are you saying, were there any moments where I have regretted? Not regretted. Or, or like, you and like, Yeah, how did you overcome the, the difficulty to put your own personal liberty over kind of the larger risks that were at stake in your case? <laughs> I mean, it's never hard, it's never easy when you are facing three life sentences plus 200 years. <laughs> So you're always thinking that's a possibility, and therefore you're paying a price for what you believe in, and that's what sustains you. And you know that this is this was a critical case, 
and therefore, as all particular cases, uh, you would have uh, made a determination much earlier on that this was a possibility that you could be persecuted for your beliefs and your and your uh, opinions and, and your positions. I did not expect it, obviously, but when it happened, you would have to, uh, to keep the faith. But also, uh, when you have a <coughs> people who are surrounding you with support and love, and um, especially your family, that also sustains you. So, uh, you know, I, I am asked often what really sustains you. I mean, it's the faith. The faith the faith uh, and the, the belief in the justice of your cause. But you can never, when you are facing this kind of thing, you can never ex know what to expect. And therefore, you have to be prepared for all the possibilities. I am among the lucky ones. There were over a thousand cases in the US. We're only one, four, or five. I was one of them. But there are hundreds of people today behind bars who have absolutely done nothing, nothing wrong. You know, nothing that would uh, actually justify their life in prison or 65 years in prison or 86 years in prison as some people have been sentenced. So uh, knowing this, obviously, you, uh, you never feel that you have overcome all the difficulties because this is the exception of the rule. And it's, it pains you when you spend decades in a country that you think uh, they value you know, these, these, these ideals that they claim to value, you know, these constitutional protections that people think that you have, that you can speak your mind and you can take positions where you can actually uh, challenge government and speak truth to power. All these things that we, you know, been talking about and you could see it crumbling before your own eyes because the powers to be decided that you'll be a target. And that's what happened to many people. And I hope we take a moment and actually learn about their cases because these are not numbers, these are real cases, real people. And, and the families are, are, are today are suffering because of these injustices that have taken place. Thank you. Can I just reiterate what the doctor said there? Like we, we, we <coughs> especially as academics, we try and think about kind of the metro issues on, on these things, right? So you know, I do encourage you. There are so many different organisations out there that talk about the human stories of people who are going through the deten detentions and the war on terror. We learn about the human being that sits at the center of these cases. It's not good enough that we just look at data and, and, and crunch Islamophobia like it was just another number, right? But we actually have to get to the center of it uh, by looking at the hearts of these people, Sean. Okay, I want to turn to uh, Dr. Bouet. Um, China has been in the news a lot lately with their crackdown on Uyghur Muslims. Is it because of Islamophobia? What's the real reason uh, behind? this program to put them in concentration camps and strip them of their heritage. <coughs> What's their main motivation? Uh, okay, so I think I mentioned yesterday, I don't think at the government level it's uh, Islamophobia, it, the causes for this kind of action. Uh, I think this is more about the social control and the way autocratic uh, government they dealing with people. So uh, unfortunately, uh, the Uyghur people, Muslims, they became the first way to be targeted. And uh, at the same time, we also should not forget, like uh, Christian, nowadays they also on a lot of the news, and also feminist. So I mean, in, in, in China, when you became the challenger of the state, or your ideology, or your move, uh, your cap capacity to networking with each other or mobilized by certain kind of ideology or uh, belief, then it became the threat to the states. So that's why no matter you are a labor uh, activist, feminist, or you are a Muslim or a Christian, then you'll be targeted. So I think in Xinjiang it's more a, uh, it's a there's another element that is the secularist uh, movement which is also to be used by the government to justify what they're doing. But it's, uh, it will be, let's wait and see. The social stability, the reason not to contain social stability will be used frequently by Chinese government sooner or later in other provinces in China. Uh, it's uh, already, they just extend the, the, uh, the definition of uh, extremism or to extend the uh, definition of a different kind of activity which means to be uh, 
dangerous. Uh, this is also happening in Hong Kong. It's uh, like uh, before in Hong Kong, if you uh, advocate independence movements, that will also be okay because it's uh, freedom of speech. But nowadays, uh, no matter the central government or the Hong Kong government, either you mention the word in the university, so it's just like Hong Kong independent movement, that would be considered to be a challenge. So, yeah, so Thank that's you. why I would say at the individual level, there is an Islamophobia existing. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Khadija, um, what do you call my fellow British uh, national? Um, you know, the UK is a highly securitized environment, and you do, you study British Muslims, and it's kind of ethnographic work, right? And well, you know, that's, what you're, that's your role, and that's what you're doing. How do you do it? in such a securitized environment, like, you know, how do you do it without making your subject of your study feel like they are under interrogation by you as a scholar who's trying to ultimately help the community, right? Yeah. And, and how do you kind of like try and stop them from being re-traumatized yeah. by, through that process? Yeah, so, so that's, I'm really glad you read that. It's something I discussed in um, part of my book, um, the experience that I had in conducting interviews and, um, and speaking with people, and as you say, I mean, you know, I'm, I am, I'm studying my own community. I'm a British Muslim. I grew up interacting with, you know, many of my interviewees are people who I know or who my parents knew, or um, you know, I've got some kind of connection with, you know, through one other person, kind of thing, degree of separation or whatever. Um, and despite that, I was still met with significant apprehension with some people actually. That you know, even though I, I would have thought I was an interviewee, you know, you can trust me, kind of thing. Um, I would still get asked, why are you doing this? What's your real reason? Um, or, or given very, quite, quite cagey answers, that you've got to sort of coax, uh, no pun intended, <laughs> um, uh, but yeah. Uh, but but so, we become interrogators, don't we? Yes, um, I, I think there is, you, you have to, um, I think in a way I had, I had um, it was useful that I, that I have, you know, I've got that sort of advantage, I guess, of, of an in-depth understanding of, the backgrounds of some of the people I speak to, the backgrounds of the the, um, the context within which they work, um, you know, it's something that I, I sort of have as as as, as uh, that I've acquired over time, um, and I, I, from that I hope I've got a bit of sensitivity that I'm able to sort of uh, indicate how people can trust me in, in certain ways through through certain, you know through expressing you know through reassuring them in certain ways I guess. Um, but it, uh, yeah, it, it's been a challenge, and I think an important aspect has been for me to, you know, obviously I've got to maintain objectivity, but at the same time, I think there's no harm in showing empathy with people when you're speaking to them and demonstrating them and involving them. And I think, ethically speaking, aside from aside from the whole securitization issue, which has definitely been and continues to be a major shadow of the work that I do in terms of speaking to people and writing about, being aware of the audience I'm writing about, it's, you know, the way that I, even the words I choose even. Um, the outlet that I, that I choose to write with. Um, I think, ethically speaking, in carrying out research, it, it's always good practice to involve your participants um, to, to make sure that you know they, they, they know the score exactly that they're getting involved in, and also actually even hope they get something out of it. And so that's also something that I try my best to do. Um, and I think people also appreciate that. So, I thought I appreciate that. Dr. Uh, James Carr, it uh, appears that um, Many of the proponents behind the Islamophobia network um, also happen to be pro-Israel Zionists. Um, what is the connection between the two movements? Where do they intersect? And why? Um, why is that connection there? Well, uh, uh, it's a big question, right? Yeah. Um, but it was, it's, it's funny, and coming from the Irish context and. Within right now in our parliament in Ireland, we are looking at putting through a bill that would support BDS. I will be one of the first governments to do this. Um, I just read before I came out here the other day that our prime minister was saying something like, you know, he's not going to support it, but the parliament's going to support it. There is within the Irish context, there is um, a Zionist lobby. Within the US, the UK, Europe, it's there. Um, the construction, and if we just simply think of the use of that term, that war on terror term, how that's been appropriated by the likes of the uh, Zionist regime, uh, the manner in which um, Muslims, um, 
Palestinians are constructed as being terrorists. And it's just a turn of phrase that's been used time and time again to, to support the structures that are there. If you go to the north of Ireland, you go on the Falls Road in the north of Ireland, it's a nationalist area. You can see on the wall, Yasser Arafat, mural. You can see Palestinian flag, mural. You can see Nelson Mandela, mural. You will see uh, Bobby Sands, the late Bobby Sands, mural. If you go to a Guineanist area, you will see um, poppies. You will see the Queen. You will see Union Jacks. And you will see the Israeli flag. So for me, as, uh, as, as, as a nationalist Irish person, um, which when I say this, of course, I do not advocate violence. I kind of feel like I almost have to say that. Um, it's quite clear for me where empire starts and empire finishes. And it's quite clear to me the role that Zionism uses in, in terms of colonialism within the Palestinian ter uh, territories, the occupied territories. Uh, and the manner in which this rolling of this trope of terrorist suits supporting the sort of power um, that benefits from this. So I, I think it's, it's, it's clear. Anyone, I, I was asked to debate a guy in the Irish context about, um, about Islamophobia, and I asked, who do you want me to debate? And they gave me the name of the guy. The guy's website is like, you know, anti-Islam pro-Israel. What is that about? I mean, you know, you know what I'm saying? So it's, it's, it's how, I, I don't see the, I find it difficult to separate Zionism from Islamophobia. I think it's really difficult. Um, the stuff I've done with colleagues of mine who are much more active in the Palestinian Solidarity Campaign, I do some stuff with them as well in, in the Irish context. Um, Jewish colleagues of mine, again, we, we, we talked about this, it's, it's clear. I mean, it's there. I, I, I find it difficult to separate both out. Um, I'm going to set one question up for my next turn and then ask another question because the question I want to ask, I think, requires. This is like a strategy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. You're making like the Instagram story here or something. <laughs> I've got to move around that bit now, right? So, Dr. Pardek, I want to I wanna set you up for a question for my next turn because I think this requires a bit of thought. And, you, you spoke about the Islamophobia that is historically within Turkey, right? And you know, we're familiar with some of the history. But what I want to know is, if you were to pick out one key lesson from that history that we can all benefit from, okay, in terms of what that Islamophobia was like and how um, Turkey obviously didn't move out of it completely, but at least you know started making moves to come out of that. You know, what was that? And I know that's a difficult and big question, which is why I thought if I give you some time to think about it, it might help. Uh, but Dr. Shireen, the question I wanted to ask you is, you know, thinking about um, uh, Hannah Arendt's cycle in Jerusalem um, and the finality of evil, right? What does it mean for us as Muslims when, you know, we play that banal role, right? When, when we are participants in um, the structures that, um, okay, not even as participants, not even as collaborators, but even as witnesses, as silent witnesses to that. You know, what, to what extent do we uh, embody complicity? Uh, so yeah, that's my question. Thank you, I think, I think you answered that pretty well in your own talk, um, and I want to ask you about, uh, ask you about that. I want to cook it up. So what I want now, um, I think you said, um, if, I was, if I'm to rephrase you, um, well, you said it so eloquently. I think you said you can't be complicit. If you are complicit, you are you are part of the problem. You are perpetuating it, and you you are a small problem. So um, Hannah Arendt's um, the banality of evil right now is more relevant than ever. Um, and um, and I actually use her work in my own work right now because it's such a good commentary on the normalization of terror. And I think we, as Muslims ourselves, to a large extent, uh, have internalized that. And I see that in my work, um, I think after um, either 9-11 and also after the current election, I think so many academics, especially the Muslim academics, have different hats. And um, I have not gotten into activism, so I sort of work, work with CARE, and I work with ACLU, so one of the questions with CARE is, what the ACLU wants us to do is document hate crimes on the part of Muslims. And Muslims don't do that. They don't want to do that. Because either they are scared or they have internalized it to such an extent that is not, they're not even perceiving it as, as Islamophobic or hate. 
or they're sometimes even perpetuating it. And so sort of to, even to get them to articulate that there are, they are surrounded or they are victims of Islamophobia is problematic. On the other side, to ask the perpetuators, take them to task by being complicit or sort of normalizing the discourse on the whole, the moderate Muslim discourse that I talk and write about also is, I am the good Muslim, I'm not like that kind of Muslim. Or if only we, we Muslims really take charge of who we are and sort of uh, reform and rethink the way we do what we do and our own religiosity, um, then maybe we'll get it right this time. And, and it's, it's, it's really sad to, to what extent that has been prevalent within the Muslim community. At least the ones I am seeing in North America, in New York, um, especially in academia, um, where there are few, so few of us. So um, I think what you do is you call it out. You have to be unapologetic. And the question then becomes not about how you, or what kind of a Muslim you are. And, and sort of an apologist kind of a framework. You just sort of affirm every part of your religiosity and your Muslimness and say that's who you are. And that's what I have at least tried to emulate and do. And I think we all have to do that. Thank you. That's really wonderful. You. So, do you really have uh, a question for Dr. Talib next? I already gave it. And when is he going to answer? All right. After you ask the next question. Oh, okay. So, <laughs> I'm not going to ask him a question. Okay. <laughs> Um, unless, so I'll go back to uh, uh, James Carr. Um, you're the closest one to me, so I feel like I need to interrogate you the most. This is the hot seat. So, so it's getting warmer. <laughs> what uh, measures need to be taken to combat, uh, not physical, but uh, yeah. sorry. <laughs> Since you're in the north. Um, the North is, you know, Game of Thrones is, uh, starts today. Yeah. The North is coming. <laughs> um, what measures need to be taken to combat the spreading of Islamophobia in schools in uh, Britain? Because it seems like the material is Islamophobic and they're, you know, planting seeds of Islamophobia at a very young age. How do you undo that? What measures to do, you know, to confront it and counter it? Sure. Um, I can't really speak to the British context because about 100 years ago we got independence. Um, so I'm pretty pleased about that. <laughs> you can applaud that, it's cool. <laughs> um, I can speak generally um, in terms of the education. So I've been working with a project um, in the Irish context which looks at... Well, okay, so it, it comes out of research that I undertook with Muslim communities in Dublin. And what we wanted to do is see what, within the communities, what we can do to ch try and challenge at that kind of micro level um, anti-Muslim racism. And I'm very mindful actually of the Seams um, point earlier on about collaborating and, and that sort of thing. It's, it's nothing like that because I would be equally as critical and I think that's really, really strong and really needed criticism as well. But what we looked at and what people wanted was something in the classroom that would not just talk about Islam, it's not like biryani and bajis and this kind of thing, okay? It's talking about anti-Muslim racism. Okay, so talking about racism as racism, talking about the, as, as best you can uh, to address processes of racialization to kids in the second level school context. So what we have, and we're currently piloting, is a resource that goes in at second level, which talks about, sets up a sort of, it fits in with what's called the civic, uh, political and social education curriculum in, in the Irish uh, second level uh, curriculum. So it will be for kids 13 to 16 years of age, junior cycle. And what it does is it sets up and engages with, on a human rights basis, um, it gives broadly with equality and diversity, but also gets in and under the hood and talks about racism. And it sets up racialization of Muslims and it parallels that with racialization of Irishness, historically. Okay? It, it takes the minority religion perspectives within the Irish context, so was it Protestantism, and how that has been othered as non-Irish historically. And it uses examples from people who are like celebrities. Okay? So, and this person talking about not fitting in. And then it parallels that with Muslims in Ireland, so Irish Muslims. Because we still have this thing in Ireland that all Muslims are immigrants, okay? Um, which is a really frustrating discourse. But um, and then it moves on into the experiences of things that I would have written that have been you know, published by the National Broadcaster that engaged with um, Boris Johnson and, and, and referring to Muslim women as letterboxes and this kind of thing. Um, right through to 
using definitions of racism and talking about racism. So it tries to, try to hit it head on, but to hit it head on in a way that um, teachers will buy into, because first of all, we have to deal with the teachers, in-service and pre-service teacher training and their biases, parents and their biases, when their kid comes home and says, I've been learning about Islam and Muslims, all right? Um, but trying to get communicated to kids, look, that this is racism and these are the impacts of and how it impacts upon average Muslim uh, folks. The voices that run throughout the, 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 the resource at the moment are voices of young Muslims who took part in the research. So they're talking about their experiences of being part of it. So that's something I'm working on. I mean, inshallah it will work, all right? Um, inshallah, but it's, 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 it's a work in progress and we'll see how things go. But that's one, that's one micro way we can chip in. Okay, thank you. So Dr. Pala, please. Uh, so the question I asked was about you know, what kind of lessons we can learn from this. You alluded to this history before at the end of your talk, but I think you kind of like left a sign game because all of us wanted to know, well, 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 well what that was that? What was it? And how did you guys overcome it? Because that's a real, it's a real history and it's a real lesson for us all. Well, actually, it was only one sentence, but uh, you <laughs> it really seriously, okay? Well, let me uh, begin with my own story. Uh, I am a graduate of a school called Imam Ahif School. This is a secondary school in Turkey, okay? The graduates of that school are supposed to be imams only. You cannot go further. You can, but you know, it was restricted. Then I moved on to uh, Faculty of Islamic Studies. That's where I studied Islam. So I started learning and studying Islam from my early age, actually. Then I went to UK for my master's and PhD. I came back to Turkey in 1999, right? And actually, after my PhD, I worked at the Warwick University as a postdoc, right? So I found a job there, actually, with my old you know, background in an Muslim society. When I came back to Turkey, it was 1999, right after the uh, 1997 coup process in Turkey that has overthrown the government, actually, not through direct intervention, but through media, through uh, you know, other things, through the uh, army's pressure. When I came to Turkey, I applied to public universities with no result, right? There was no job for me. But there was a job for me in the UK. If I stayed there, I could have found a job, but I had to come back for civil reasons. And I applied for, uh, to uh, private universities in Turkey, and again, there was a similar case. Why I am telling this story? Because of my background, uh, and al although I had some degrees in uh, in the UK as well as Europe. Uh, so I was really helpless in a sense. It was 1999. I'm not talking about 1930s and 40s and 50s, you know, when this uh, idea of secularism, Kemalism, was the founding uh, principle of uh, modern Turkey. Right? So you can see how the political elite in Turkey tried to sociologically and politically engineer a society, and also they kept it the power. However, what we have seen as the, the lesson to learn, such kind of engineering, uh, despite the will of the people, cannot prevail. That's what we have seen. Now, in 2001 and 2002, things have changed in Turkey. Ten years ago, you were not going to be able to have such a conference here, because the veiled women were not allowed to go to the university. So, not only they were not allowed to go to university, if you happen to, you know, uh, raise yourself, you were not allowed to work in the public sector. You cannot be a teacher, you cannot be a doctor, you cannot be a lawyer, you know, blah, blah, blah. Things have changed now. That, I think, is a lesson that we can learn to, you cannot really run against the current of sociology of the, of the country. But this is a Muslim community society. We are talking Islamophobia in different contexts. For Turkey, it was because of the pressure of the people, because of the leadership, because of the political process, because of the openness of the society, democratization, let's say, there were a lot of instruments that people could engage and use to overcome these issues. Now, there is a, a different political uh, climate in Turkey, which really opened up to freedom of religion, I would say, and we had a French style uh, uh, perception of secularism in Turkey, which was a hostile for religion. I mean, everybody will tell you different stories from their own you know, personal lives, but I'm not going to go into that. But I would say this Turkey is largely a Muslim country, 
They're not necessarily the same color. People have, you know, liberal ideas, some, you know, more, uh, let's say, uh, extreme ideas, some have uh, moderate main. He can call that. There are different colors of, I think, Islam in this country. But what is prevailing here is that the uh, people who like to practice their religion, uh, but uh, this has happened in Turkey not through violence. I think this is one of the important things that we need to elevate. This has uh, happened through a gradual political uh, participation and its transformation in Turkey. Uh, however, uh, when we compare, I think, uh, a Muslim-dominated society, which is not being colonized, so we don't have that kind of experience, which is inherited through great Ottoman legacy and heritage. And there are many things that are different from each other, but when you look at the mindset of those people who were really trying to push Islam out of public sphere in Turkey, we have lots of similarities between the Turkish case and the non-Turkish case, is where you can see strong xenophobia. And can I suggest that maybe it would be amazing if uh, there could be like an auto-ethnographic account in an essay form for Sega around your experiences. I think that would be really quite a wonderful contribution for the organization to be able to publish for all of us to benefit from each other. Yeah. <laughs> okay, yeah, thank you. Um, Varsha, welcome again. There's, uh, it seems like you know, Islamophobia is on the rise in India. There's a lot of Islamophobes that are brown people. You know, we kind of think of Islamophobia, ethno-nationalist, white nationalist, Eurocentric, but then you have these brown people that are, that kind of look like the Muslims, but they're still Islamophobic and they're kind of crazy. Some of these Hindu, uh, you know, maniacs uh, going to the point, you know, extremes of violence. And now, you know, some allege that, of course, the prime minister himself comes from that type of heritage. Uh, with blood on his hands uh, from previous massacres. Is there any connection between, uh, or what are the connections between these Islamophobes, leading Islamophobes in India and ones in the West? Are they co collaborating? Are they cooperating? Are they part of the wider global, you know, anti-Muslim machine? Well, um, as I hinted yesterday uh, during my paper, in India, Islamophobia did not have to be um, um, exported some from elsewhere. It, it is um, homemade because um, of our uh, partition history. And even before partition, we can see, because uh, we were Muslims, uh, Muslim rulers, I mean, the Mughal Empire, all the rulers who came to India, it is, so you are not already there. You came from somewhere, and then you became Muslim. The rest of the population became Muslim. So it was always as if Muslims were invaders, and with invading, they started um, hinting that that means the the pure population, the Hindu population, they were converted, but not uh, by will, but by force. So this has always been a part of the history. But then, as um, historians like Gyanin Drapandi note, suddenly after independence, what we saw in, in books is that everybody imagining this, um, this wonderful idea of India, which is very, very secular, which is very inclusive, and as Nehru and Gandhi envisioned it. But then, you cannot forget there was a Jinnah. And there was um, Muslim leaders who were for and against Pakistan. So this is there. And it is into this context, uh, if we read in the Hindu nationalists, we can see their, um, their main ideologues like Savarkar, Golwarkar. These people actually <coughs> revered Hitler. They were like, OK, this is the kind of um, uh, ideology that we should have. Hindus should have these kind of expressions of their own Hinduism wherein we don't subsume to another race. Or that is how Muslims became racialized. It was like it was another race. So they are, they are overcoming us. And that 
that he has followed through. And for Modi being uh, uh, their forerunner, you see uh, the BJP, the Hindu Nationalist Party, only had only won two seats in 1989 uh, to the parliament. And from there, in 2014, the BJP won the majority, the single majority party it became. Because till then, everybody was ruling as a coalition, and BJP won the total majority. So that, from that figures, from two in 1989 to the rise in 2014, where we got nearly 287 or something, I don't remember the figures correctly. So it was totally inborn uh, Islamophobia. We didn't have to export it from anywhere. But it helped that 9-11 happened, that helped. And now uh, we increasingly see how India is handling Kashmir means there is strong Israeli support. We can see there has been trainings, collaborative trainings being run between Indian um, uh, police, uh, uh, Indian intelligence agencies and the Israeli agencies. So it is being projected by the uh, Hindu nationalists as, uh, as something that India is uh, achieving as a major achievement that our security processes are, uh, we are being trained by Israeli and Muslims are uh, but the, at the receiving end of all this kind of training. Thank you. Just to clarify, you said 9 11 helped, helped increase Islamophobia. Yes, that is what I meant. Okay, yeah. yeah, help the yes, international. Uh, people will uh, cut and paste and you know edit your clip, and then you know, that will be the theme of this conference. <laughs> and then Trump will tweet it, and then it becomes. Yeah, it's better. like okay, well, that we may not return home. Yeah. Uh, so, <laughs> which is not a bad thing not to return home. Oh, okay, no, I don't know. I have some kids I want to see. Yeah. Doctor <laughs> Sadik. <laughs> Dr. Um, you know, Allah SWT commands us to cooperate with one another based on, um, you know, kind of righteousness and uh, being conscious of God, right? Um, how can we cooperate with one another as, a, as an activist, as a grassroots activist, uh, an organizer? How can we cooperate when we have such strong sectarian minds uh, that are, seem to inhibit us all the time? Well, um so I work for an institute, half an institute for a fair and inclusive society. Uh, uh, I remember that uh, I moved from Ohio to five of us to build the infrastructure, to that the intellectual infrastructure. So the question that we face is that, so we have two million dollars. What are we going to do with it? What are we going to study? We come in all from different backgrounds, but mainly from the legal environments, but the backgrounds. So we decided to put the question for this question in particular, the question of othering and a question of belonging. We most likely understand what othering means, but not necessarily we understand how to do belonging. So uh, 2015, we initiated the Paris conference in othering and belonging. People laughed at us. So we extended the invitation for 5,000 people. We received 600 people. Before I came from the from, to this conference, we had our third one. Uh, we have to shut down the registration. It get so popular in terms of producing uh, intellectual work, but more more importantly, we produce work in the ground. So within less than five years, we built coalition with more than five thousand CBOs, community-based organizations throughout the United States. How we did that work? So we spend all our intellectual and financial capacity in order to bridge what we could agree on, what those subjects are. Uh, we don't talk about the divide. So what we have here in common, what we can do together, beyond just Islam, but what we can do together that is meaningful to all of us and allow us to make a, a tent in the system that is so rotten. So I think when we put those type of questions, we will be surprised by how much in common actually we have, more than how we have to divide us. So we refuse to accept, uh, you know, we find genuine people, oh, I can work on this people of faith in particular, but I really don't like people of the LGBT, I can't do that. We said, okay, you don't have to defend them, but don't stay in their way. You see? 
So uh, I, I don't like to deal with sexuality. That's fine. You can stay in the outer ring, but let us work in sexuality. So so, so the question becomes like always. Uh, we don't have to uh, bridge to the devil. Don't we'll start there. Let's start from something easy that we all agree, and that's we have massive challenges uh, facing our human existence, our relationship to the natural world, the ontological questions. So I think that everybody would like to work in. Uh, I mean, I'm not suggesting that I could work with my nationalists, but that I could work with Muslim conservatives. Dr. Ann, um, how does the clash of civilization impact Islamophobia today? Does it continue to drive it? I mean, there's a lot of talk about that, and I think you know, in your book, you cover this. Is it as relevant today, or did Islamophobia take a life of its own now? Um, I think it lurks behind that it gives a certain historical resonance to Islamophobia, and I do think it haunts the it, the question of Palestine that. There, the, the production, particularly in the United States, but not solely in the United States, of a vision of Israel as, um, as a civilizational model and a profound othering of the Palestinians has, has really become profoundly normalized. Um, when I was in college, I was at a, some talk and I heard two of my professors talking and they said, they were, they were teasing each other and they said, the Jews have been the Jews for too long. We're tired of being the Jews. We're not going to be the Jews anymore. And, um, and I was very young and I, I said, well, somebody else already is the Jews. And they both turned around to look at me and they said, who? And I said, the Palestinians. And this, was, this required no great apprehension on my part. It was obvious. And the fact that it was not obvious to them was startling to me at that point, and it remains troubling to me that that divide has become profoundly normalized for the United States, and I think it is something we still need to overcome. It's one of my one of my reasons for my infinite respect for Dr. Sammy. Thank you, Dr. Talib. You, you keep on giving me material from everything that you say. So you, uh, you mentioned that you uh, had gone on this imam track uh, early on in your life. How do, you, how do we, not just you, how do we deal with imams who collaborate with racism and Islamophobia? Sorry, you asked for this. <laughs> now let me respond to the earlier question about the uh, sectarian divide. I think what I learned throughout my um, religious education and upbringing is that uh, you know, Islam is defined as a very comprehensive, uh, compassing, ever compassing religion. That's fine. But if you try to deal everything with the lenses of religion, there are some secular things in life, there are some you know, religious things in life, then you could try to, to address some of the questions as far as this uh, ethnic and uh, sectarian divide is concerned. There's a deep historical, I think, divide, and it is very difficult to disengage historically. It is there, and I find it very difficult to, to, uh, to overcome this divide. And if you legitimize everything in, lot, in your life with reference to religion, right? So this is, this is one case. Uh, I think the imams, uh, their articulation of Islam or the other, has something to do with this background. And also, um, in some countries, in my country, uh, education is under the strict control of the state uh, since the 1920s. And of course, these imam hadith schools are also under the um, supervision of the Minister of Education. So here there is a concept of uh, authentic Islam. So Turks claim to uh, have this authentic Islam in their curriculum. 
and of course that authenticity sometimes uh, is damaging uh, when it clashes with the other authenticities. So this is a, I think, uncharted territory. It's very difficult to say. I, I think this truth claims uh, throughout Islamic history and even today uh, is problematic. Uh, but what is happening from the other side of the coin, let's say, uh, Turkey has been sending imams to Europe for the last maybe 10 to 15 years. I think today more than 1,500 imams uh, or similar staff were sent by Turkey, by the Diyanet. So that is a cause of concern by the European, by the Westerners, because these are some of the imams, uh, you know, uh, they are the obstacle for the integration of the people. Uh, therefore, I think uh, we don't have a centralized body of uh, Islam and uh, knowledge production. Uh, so we, we have to deal with it. We have to live with it as well. I mean, sometimes uh, under the pretext of freedom of speech uh, or the diversity within the Islamic tradition, you can have such kind of uh, discourses. But maybe common uh, ground could be, as suggested by one of our colleagues, is that some, some of the well, well, universal values that people talk about, like freedom of speech, freedom of religion, freedom of faith, and also some of the um, conventions that uh, many nation states has uh, signed, have signed, like the you know, United Nations, uh, uh, European Union, or Council of Europe. I mean, these are some of the uh, documents that have some normative values. So there must be some kind of normative values and principles that we should adhere to so that there's you know, some kind of checks and balance there. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry. <coughs> Sorry. But we actually, oh yeah, go ahead and clap. Yeah. <laughs> we have some Turkish uh, fans here in the audience. I don't know if they're your students or... We please appreciate it. Yeah, they're trying to get good grades. Okay, <laughs> just kidding. Okay, it's the end of the conference. Um, we want to actually, before we turn it to the audience, but before that, I want to give each of you 90 seconds, and we're going to be very strict about this, to tell us your idea uh, of what's the most important way to confront Islamophobia for now. So starting with Dr. Sami, uh, you have 90 seconds, and then we'll come down. It's the same question for each of you. And I'm the timekeeper here. We assume you already had all the answers. That's why yeah. I'm starting with you. Well, <coughs> Jim, by the time you get to you, you won't have anything. Right? You won't have anything left to say. It's interesting. Because last year we had a whole session about, about how to confront some four at different levels, and we had about I don't know eighty recommendations or so. But basically, it comes down to understanding Islamophobia at the different levels. You know, the levels of, of all the way from the levels of ignorance and education all the way up to politics and confronting uh, political threats and geopolitical threats. So when it comes to that, we have to be armed, we have to be prepared at each level to confront it. It cannot be confronted only at one level. We heard in this conference about the structure of uh, racism that uh, basically infuses, or some form of infuses that and it helps it in <coughs> uh, achieving its own uh, uh, objectives. It could be uh, basically uh, uh, not only such as racism, but it will come all the way to the colonization of the mind and of the space. So at that level, you have to confront it differently. But as far as we're concerned in academia, as also in, in civil uh, uh, society organizations, uh, to me, the, 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 the top of it is education and also action. So it has to be uh, combined. That you can't just do education and sit back thinking people will do it. You really have to be at the front. Uh, working together with uh, organizations, with individuals, grassroots. We've done that to the best of our ability in the United States, and we have to face some consequences, but it comes to the territory. So the civil problem is a very, very dangerous threat, not only to Muslims, but I think it's, it's, it's a danger to the, to the whole society. In the United States, they start with the Muslims, but they never end with the Muslims. We saw manufacturing uh, charges uh, at the beginning with Muslims, but in the, it, 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 it uh, into others. Same thing with the uh, secret evidence. Started with, with 28 cases of Muslims, but pretty soon it was affecting the time. Thank you. Okay. Back to Saudi, go ahead. I echo everything you said. 
Very good. Thank you. <laughs> Next. <laughs> I think for me, uh, confronting Islamophobia, I, I do really agree with what Dr. Sami said, but I think Islamophobia also, uh, to confront it, we need to look at it as a liberatory work. Decolonizing the mind is not an easy job to do, and it requires multiple interventions. <laughs> so intervention in education, intervention in our community, intervention in our public policy, intervention about claiming our story, intervention about how we tell our story. So this requires multiple levels. So not the rest of the world are, uh, are colonized and we are uh, free. We are also colonized too. We need to decolonize ourselves. So that's, that's the hardest part to look in, into the mirror and to see, okay, I need to fix that. So there's a lot of work for us to do within ourselves, within our communities. And when we do that, I think we will be proud to reclaim the new narrative that where we reside. So for myself, I reside in California Republic. So I will claim the story of Muslims in the Republic of California, and which is a different story, and I hope to experience throughout uh, the rest of the environment. Thank you very much. Optimistic. Very much. We'll see you in Hollywood. Since we're in California, so we're going to send it to the world. Okay. So coming to the, my own experience uh, as an example, I think uh, raise the awareness of the public, realize there is a, do you have this kind of a problem, it's very important. Because uh, when I, I do this research, and uh, after I finished my paper in 19, in 1916, the political environment uh, allowed people to discuss this kind of issue. I, I talked to a lot of uh, Chinese media. So uh, it became an issue, and, uh, it's worth, and also using my own oh. social media account. So it was controversial. People uh, criticism or uh, hate speech a lot, but the thing is, it's raised the awareness and people really think about whether we do have this kind of issue. Because for us, sometimes uh, normalize our activities and they just think that it's okay, this is the way it is. Second thing I think, uh, uh, according to my revelation, uh, observation, I think for Chinese Muslim, uh, Muslims, it's more effective for them to counter or communicate or explain, or uh, yeah, to with the outside group members instead of just the complain or uh, to be victimized within the group. So yeah, talk to others or even argue or fight with others, which is more effective, especially on social media. You know the norms of the internet is totally different. You know how you must know how to use it and how to to communicate with people who are not familiar with your. Uh, familiar with the religious, are familiar with others. Yeah, that's it. Fight with people on social media. That's what we heard, right? <laughs> okay, so um, I think what I want to talk about can be summed up really using the word solidarity. Um, and by that, I, um, I guess so many levels that you can understand that. But I think, you know, we've heard in the course of um, this conference about several examples of people who've given immense sacrifices and uh, taken huge risks. Um, uh, you know, we've got to be there for each other, to lift each other up, to amplify each other's voices, uh, to support each other, to fill in for each other, you know, whenever necessary. Um, you know, we, we know that Islamophobia happens on various levels, from the structural to each people's attitudes, to their actions. Um, you know, we've got to be there to defend each other when somebody's attacked <coughs> on various levels. And when I say this, I also mean that we have to offer our solidarity to other people. Uh, because that's the, 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 that's the only logical, it's only just, right? So that we are Muslims, are, sure, are facing Islamophobia, but Islamophobia is not obviously a problem, it's a societal problem, just as other forms of prejudice and discrimination are societal problems. And, you know, we've got to be, you know, we've got to have, you know, it, we can't have that narrow vision and just be obsessed with Islamophobia at the expense of other injustices and there are many. And at saying that, the other thing I wanted to highlight in, in, in looking at Islamophobia is that we've got to, to use, um, Dr. Sadek's phrase, use this mirror and look within our own communities at the injustices that happen within our own communities and the discrimination and the racism and the misogyny and, and everything else that happens within our own communities and actually deal with that, talk about that and uh, rectify that. Um, so, yeah, that's me. Thank you. I think everyone echoed exactly what I wanted to say. So, um, 
using Paula Prairie, who I use a lot in my classrooms. I think it is about liberatory education and pedagogy. I think it is about, like Dr. Sami said, about thought and action. You cannot be, we can't be those of us who are academics, uh, we cannot be sitting in ivory towers talking about Islamophobia. And we said that if we are not changing those thoughts of ours into actions and creating spaces of change and transformation and doing it intentionally and building coalitions across the board with different people. It's really important. And on a side note, I just really want to sort of share something, and this um, um, goes to um, Dr. Sami um, as, as a tribute in terms of being a role model. Um, I was not, I mean, I wasn't asked how you got into this, but I'll just share this with you. I, my background is in philosophy. I was an untenured professor um, going about teaching Hegel, Heidegger, and gender studies, um, not juxtaposed usually, but I did. And then um, and when 9-11 happened, and suddenly people were sort of asking me nothing about my work, but who I was, my, my, my Muslimness, my religion. And then I started getting a little political, I started writing, and then suddenly I was starting to be told that stop, this is dangerous, please right. stop, I'll run ten years. And then while this is all happening, I, and one of, at that time, in 2000, not too many people in the US were writing on this topic. We had the, we had a book Saeed, but you didn't have sort of big people talking about Islamophobia and Muslims' identity, Dr. Sami was one of them. So we used to, a lot of us who were sort of using his work, talking about his work, and then um, that 9-11 that happened, and then that, that sort of the policing and the lynching of academics started happening. And this was, and, and, and your situation was really a role, as a role model to all of us to say, you know what, you don't have to back down. You don't have to be silent. And you really have to believe in yourself and go ahead with what you do in your own um, beliefs. And I, so many of us, and I myself, I've really channeled that on my life. So I just want to thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you. That's wonderful. Um, yeah, so um, in 90 seconds, then I would say, one is as um, we were having a conversation, as him and as him was reminding me, how um, all this is set up to distract us from really the, the right questions that uh, we need to be addressing regarding development, etc. So in that sense, um, uh, as a community, I would want uh, our community not to get distracted. Uh, then, then what are we doing? That it might seem so, but this is also a necessary thing. We are doing it. We are trying to counter Islamophobia, but then that should not be the whole aim. It's like as Dr. El Salas was. As Salik was saying, we also need to uh, work towards bringing structural changes. So, and and at this point, I think uh, maybe everywhere, but also from the Indian context, it means having political power because that is where we can actually actually uh, dismantle these structures of inequality. It is it is actually there for a reason, right? Inequality is put in place because it it furthers certain interests. So to change that, we need to have power, not just intellectually, but structurally, we need to take up that power. So we need to work towards getting political power, especially in India. So, and the third thing would be, and in this, in this, um, uh, how to figure this out? In this figuring out, I've usually seen Muslim uh, organizations actually rushing to distinguish between uh, themselves as the good Muslims. These organizations keep doing that, that we are the good Muslim organization, that the others are not that, so that we are to be acclaimed by the government, and in this play, uh, the whole community is losing out. So that is one of my goals where I keep thinking, we need to bring together these people, we somehow need to figure out, as academics, I think, they cannot see beyond their differences. So maybe there is um, a necessity that when we can sit aside and see what they are uh, doing wrong, uh, maybe we should think Thank about you. ways to. Yeah. I know Turkish people are always on time. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Well, I, think I, was, I am not very um, optimistic on that issue, actually. <laughs> 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 not on the timing. On the timing, I am. I am. Oh, you are not though. On the, on the, right. 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 I am talking about. So whether uh, we can confront, whether we can encounter, overcome Islamophobia, that is a, a, a 
it's a very difficult uh, issue because, as I said, Islamophobia has something to do with the presence of Islam as a challenge to the non-Islam things, I would say, I should summarize. But let's try to do something anyway. Uh, in my view, unless we have a, a legal framework to deal with Islamophobia, whatever we do, we just, um, you know, melt away. Yes, we can work with the media, uh, the academia, we can publish things, and civil society, we can work together. But I think at the end of the day, as you mentioned, you need to have some kind of state structure that can create some norms and principles that would prevent violation of Islam and Muslims here and there. So this is not there yet, and we have to like, work uh, towards that. Therefore, we need to uh, maybe emphasize this uh, citizenship, rights, freedoms, legal protections. So these are not a religious language, as you can see. These are not Islamic discourse. So we need to have such discourse and I think share the, uh, um, let's say, podium with all these people. Uh, that will help us. And also we need to engage. I think Islamophobia is usually in places where there is a Muslim majority. Okay? So we skip Muslim majority states. Now, there is uh, one of the partners of this meeting is uh, OIC. Uh, there are 57 members of this OIC, including Turkey. And we need to engage all these, I think, nation states to raise this issue, to put pressure on their partners. So when they're buying weapons, when they're doing this and that, I think uh, that should be part of the game. I was heading Turkish delegation at the Council of Europe, Parliamentary Assembly. Until we went there, nobody discussed those issues. So that is a high level parliamentary assembly. Yes, you cannot have an easy result, but we can raise the consciousness because there are 50, 47 member states. And I think politicians must be part of that uh, strategy, otherwise the voices will, uh, will disappear. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, you did. Thank you. you honor your people <laughs> with being on time. Uh, first, I think we should abandon the discourse and the idea of integration. I think that the proper approach to um, to people who are different from us, whether one is uh, when, whether one is entering or whether one sees people entering, is to say, what can we learn from these people, and what can I do that they do that makes me a better person and that would make us a better people. So I think this integration talk should just be eliminated immediately. Um, the second thing, the second thing is um, I'm very much in favor of, um, of what I call ordinary interventions. And I suppose the easy way to say this is let nothing evil happen when you are there. That is to say, you know, just just intervene. Um, it's, it is an opportunity which which one should welcome. But the final thing, and um, Asim does this more directly, I think, than, than most of us, but I, it is, I think, finally the most important thing, and that is protect people from the power of the state um, and protect them in their body. That is to say, this is not an abstract question. This is a question of the preservation of individual lives and wholeness. So torture, uh, hunger, the deprivation of shelter, the separation of people, that all of these things that confront people at their most intimate and human condition, that these are things which I think are have the first demand on our, on our country. Very good time. Yeah. No pressure. Yeah. Um, okay, so, um, Notwithstanding what um, Dr. Talak was saying about the, this, this phenomenon that Islamophobia that's been with us for over centuries and centuries, um, a few suggestions building on, I think, what people would have said over the course of the last couple of days. I think we need to look at uh, producing counter knowledges, counter narratives, um, using examples like uh, Farid Hafez, you know, through the delegitimizing Islamophobia through the legal system as best we can, given the, the restrictions around there. Um, the arts, um, identifying allies that we can work with across a whole range of different communities, uh, reflecting what uh, Sadiq said a few moments ago. Um, 
I think we need to get off the back foot as well and display a confident, robust Muslim identity that's not always on the defensive. Um, that would be a proud Muslim identity that is on the front foot and goes out there and takes on these stereotypes. It's not always on the defensive and, and, and on the back foot. I think this notion of collaboration has to be really challenged because there are far too many people, Muslim and non-Muslim, who are benefiting um, from, from, for example, prevent strategies and otherwise. Um, whether it's politically or whether it's financially or both. There's far too much of that going on. We can engage with the system, but we need to engage with the system with our eyes open and try to have these little changes um, from the, the grassroots up, if at all possible. Um, media, policing, education are all areas that can be engaged with in a meaningful way. Eyes open, as I would say. Okay, finish. Thank you. Let's give uh, all our scholars a big round of applause again. <laughs> Staying here until the end of the conference and remaining, you know, participating, listening to each other. Um, so that's really important. Now we're going to turn to the audience. We have about uh, 25 minutes of conversation. Um, Everyone except your name. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you'll get the last question. Yeah. Um, so. We'll start with the back, if you please uh, get a microphone. Actually, we'll start with the front, our keynote speaker. Sorry. We'll go to you next. Uh, I haven't heard uh, um, um, the rule of um, psychology in dealing with uh, Islamophobia. Uh, in the three-day conference, maybe <coughs> Western uh, countries. I mean, uh, Western psychology, uh, particularly in since in the 19s, in the 19s, they are uh, uh, they have uh, positive psychology, speaking about positive emotion and and, and also cognitive behavior therapy. And so all this, I think, is useful, maybe. Uh, to uh, very therapeutic to, to deal with people who are because the term Islamophobia itself, I mean from a psychological perspective, those who, who have phobia, how how to treat them? I mean, you have to relax the muscle, you have to, to relax the mind, you have to relax them, um, and then uh, and then ready for behavioral changes. I mean, uh, psychologically, and also I heard the word pathological. Pathological, also psychological term, that um, and it, uh, is, it is it is uh, 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 chronic and it is very difficult uh, to change. But wherever it is, um, uh, for Western society, or uh, particularly non-Muslim, I don't like to use the word non-Muslim, but I feel like uh, as if we uh, we differentiate or we 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 put, we, we press on the otherness. Yeah, but. Uh, for the sake of discussion, so I think there is, there is, we should be uh, optimistic. There is way. I think let's try psychological, uh, uh, therapeutic way to change the behavior of people. As for internal problem of Muslim, because we have a lot of, we have also Islamophobia among among Muslim. So among Muslim, of course, we have ethics, we have spirituality, and combination all together, we have psychology in between. So inshallah we can change. Thank, Thank you very you. much. And uh, Imam once uh, told me to instead of, to, uh, instead of using non-Muslims, say people of other faith. People of other faith. Or of no faith. So it's not other in them. It's, you know, again, trying to make the white people feel comfortable right, to go out of our way. I wonder, I wonder not why, otherize them. But what was the language that's used in the Quran? You know, like, I just wonder. <laughs> oh no! Yeah. We're gonna assume. We're gonna stay optimistic. We're not gonna use the other word. I'm not in this conference. Okay. Now while I'm in this panel. All right. Decolonize our language, people. All right. Just think about that too. I think we have to be in another room in a minute. All right. Next question. Assalamu alaikum for everyone. I'm Sumaya. I'm from Egypt. Oh, awesome. Thank you. 
So thanks for giving solution for Islamophobia problem. So my question is, as a student, what are the first steps that should I do for solve this problem? Especially that I am not, unfortunately, I'm not president in Arabic country. I don't have political muscles to have like effect on people minds. I cannot, if I share some posts on Facebook, just my friends will read it. Just my neighborhood, just like my mother and my father, and they will support me. So, yeah. So I want to have like effective rule on the society. So do you think that just ad giving advices for my friend, for my neighborhood is a good idea? Especially that not everyone will accept me. And especially that why I say like, well, I wish I were a president in Arabic country because no one take a like serious step against anyone speak about Islam. And you know now we saw like many like stupid speech about Islam I say against women about hijab. So why no one speak? So I hope like that's one anyone speak uh, take strict rule against them, punish them. No one moves. So, what do you think as a student, as I have a like, small effective rule on the society? Thank you. So, thank you. We'll take one more. It seems like we have some support for it. Okay, gentlemen. I am Safiyan from Afghanistan. I am a student of Sabah Tinzam University, Political Science and International Relationship. Actually, I have a question uh, to Professor Yuli. Did I say it correctly? Because. Yuli. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry if it's wrong. Uh, you mentioned before that it's, uh, the question is asked: What's the reason for the Islamophobia or concentrating? Uh, the Uyghur people in, the chi in China. So you said that it's not just for Islam, it's also for other ideologies because of the bigoted policy of the chi Chinese government. So the question is, even, it, even though it's bigoted and you know that, and you are speaking Islamophobia here, representing the Chinese government, so what's the reason that you are putting your life danger <laughs> by speaking of Islamophobia and it's against the ideology of the Chinese government. Can you just elaborate this? Thank you. Okay, we'll start with the last question since he picked someone. Um, aren't you afraid to talk about Islamophobia and you have to go back to China? Is that the question? Oh, she's from Hong Kong. Yeah, from Hong Kong. Yeah, so what I want to say is I have been a journalist for more than 20 years. So the role of a journalist is uh, to uh, report the issues which is uh, uh, related to public interest. And uh, Islamophobia at that time, especially in 2016 when I decided to do this project, I had just started my PhD program. <laughs> I just think, okay, it's my instant strength. It's a new phenomenon. It's just because of the, uh, the, the uh, social media then uh, we realize there's uh, this phenomenon also uh, existing in China. But nobody talked about that. I did the research, did no, no previous research on this. So yeah, because of that year in 2016, I think it's still okay uh, to do that. But you already started. <laughs> so I think, yeah, you already started. And uh, yeah, and I also think for, it's also the responsibility for scholars. Uh, you. For the freedom of uh, uh, the academic freedom, which means uh, you will not be interfered by outside pressures on the topics uh, which you're doing, right? This is the basic thing. It's like a freedom of press. It's also the basic thing. So, yeah, if you want to be a, a, a responsible journalist or a responsible uh, scholar, uh, this is the, the, the basic line. It's like, I think we all agree with that. So, if you think it's worse to do that, and then you really, I think you have the uh, capacity to do that and yeah, just do it. And I also think yeah, it's uh, important for uh, the public to, to, um, uh, to know the work. Otherwise, only like 100 people, or maybe less than 100 people read your paper. And uh, for me, because I was a journalist, I do want my research or my findings to have some impact on the society. 
the, for example, after I, uh, in 2016, uh, some of my Chinese Muslim friends let submit my uh, uh, research paper to some uh, officials, and they do got some uh, positive uh, reaction response from it, but things change nowadays. <coughs> yeah, I just want to uh, other Muslim countries can uh, stood up and say things uh, to show their support for Uyghurs. And, uh, like uh, Mohammed bin Salman of Saudi Arabia. When he had a chance to say something, he actually supported what was happening. <laughs> right. 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 Yeah, I'm so happy here because China is a compliment mentioned and the right. Uyghurs are compliment mentioned on this day. Okay, thank you. Thank okay, you. so uh, James Carr is going to answer the question on the psychology, the question of psychology and Islamophobia. <coughs> and uh, Dr. N will answer the question about Egypt and using social media. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure I'll answer the question, as it were, but I, mean, I want to address it from, from a particular angle, and that is that it, my understanding, my so I'm a sociologist. Um, my engagement with psychology over the last number of years, when it comes to the Muslims and uh, anti-Muslim racism. I've seen psychology mentioned more often in terms of how we understand Muslims on their way to terrorism as opposed to how we understand Islamophobia. And I think there's an inherent problem that goes back to John, and I know we want to talk about this point, but when we talk about um, the psychology of anti-Muslim racism, and we start focusing on this individual pathology, we lose sight of the structures that are benefiting from Islamophobia, that construct, create, and recreate Islamophobia, anti-Muslim racism, time and time again, for benefit, whether it's Zionism, whether it's American imperialism, or whatever else. Um, so th th that's there's probably I would argue and I haven't I haven't studied the field of psychology it's not my my discipline but I would argue there's there is a, a lot of work to be done there to to actually engage properly with um, anti-Muslim racism Islamophobia being mindful of the structures that are out there again that's my own perspective on it I don't want to speak for the discipline but I would be very critical of it from my from my own side. Thank you. Um, I think the question that we can do as, as a student, or indeed as, as anyone who, who fundamentally lacks great political power, uh, but especially as a student, the thing that you can do as a student is learn. And I say that because I think one always has the impulse that you, that you express to say, you know, these people who do terrible things, if only I could banish them. But that is what we need to overcome. We need to be able to say, I can confront my enemies. I do not need to be rid of them. Or as we just said, what are my parasites to me? That is to say, one has to be able to have, to face enemies who, who actually are perhaps contemptible, perhaps evil, more likely ignorant, or slightly corrupt, or perhaps very corrupt, and say to them, and say to yourself, they could be otherwise. And I think actually Islam presents many examples of what it is to call someone out of evil. And I believe that that, that calling people out, both in the sense of calling them to account, but also in the sense of calling them out of a place of fear or ignorance or corruption where they are, and calling them to something else is part of what a real democracy would look like. Uh, yeah, I, I totally understand Sumaya's frustration. I, I, I've been there before. Uh, I think one way, I, I, I agree with what being said, but I think one way for uh, the, the youth to, to engage with with what they see yes is wrong and right and wrong is to think of it as not an individual intervention. So it's not your responsibility as an individual, but you have to have the ability to build with your community a way in which to be a collective response to that intervention. So if whatever you're thinking, you don't, uh, power will never be given to you. So you have to snatch it. And the only way you snatch power is actually to form a uh, with groups 
An individual response is the most uh, dead end, I think, and one of the disease of neoliberalism that try to transform us into individual, isolated, thinking about ourselves, self-centered, so we never get anywhere except for our own sake. So what, if, if I can give you an advice, think of building a collective, whatever that collective might be. So it's not the burden on your shoulder, you have to take it. It's a group uh, burden that needs to be changed. All right, so let's take uh, another round of uh, questions, please. Okay, so we have Dean up here. Um, we have one here and then a uh, gentleman over here. Um, thank you for the robust discussion that has been happening this afternoon. Um, I, uh, I, I have more of a comment than I do a question, but I think that it may contribute to the discussion, especially on uh, the ideas of what can be done. Um, we've heard a lot of the term of structural racism. I come from the country that perfected structural racism <laughs> and white supremacy. It was the model for it. And we have, in the last two to three days, been wondering about how ridiculous arguments of Burkinis, for example, can be raised to such a level. We had what is called the pencil test. If, we did, if, if the government didn't know whether you were black or white, they would stick a pencil in your hair. If it stuck, you were black. If it fell out, you were white. So that's the ridiculousness of white supremacy and structural racism, the remnants of which we're still dealing with to a certain degree. But at the same time, I think very much like the Irish example, we've also evolved from that um, to have a better response to the pressures of Islamophobia. Sorry, Zina, can you just clarify, you're from South Africa, right? I'm from South Africa, sorry. I think a few uh, people weren't aware of the I apologize for those who didn't know. I, I apologize. Um, the reason why I'm saying that we have learned from that and uh, that we, in a way, uh, I sometimes wonder if I come from the Islamic Republic of South Africa because of how open and how accepting our country has become of Muslims in the face of the rising Islamophobia globally. We're not immune to it and the pressures, excuse me, the pressures arise from foreign intelligence forces who come into South Africa trying to, for, uh, trying to force the government to enact legislation, and we do have anti-terrorist legislation in South Africa, but also to continue to apply pressure on the Muslim community. Uh, whilst in government, I was part of the security committee that uh, had the benefit of uh, Americans coming to us and saying, we know there are terror cells in your country, we know there's Al-Qaeda bases in your country, we know there's going to be an attack by ISIS. And one of the things was for the World Cup, we had hosted the World Cup in 2010, mounting pressure that you have to do something against your Muslim population. We know there's going to be an attack on this stadium, on this day, by the Somalis in your country. There was no such threat. And if there was even an individual amongst the Somali community, we automatically diffuse that in a very simple way by going to meet with the Somali community, discussing with them and saying, if you know of elements within your community, please don't let this happen. We don't want that to happen in our country. And it was dealt with in a very um, democratic and understanding way where you can approach people, where you can discuss it. Asim knows of many cases, I mean, uh, right now, Britain and other countries are grappling with the problem of uh, families who migrated to ISIS-controlled areas. What do we do with those people? How do you bring them back? Um, in South Africa, some of them have come home. And that is with the cooperation and discussion with government to say people migrate all over the world and want to come home eventually unless you can see that they, they have technically done something illegal and are coming back to create a problem in your country. These are young people who want to be back home. Give them an opportunity at a second chance in life. And that has happened. Um, there's, there, there, it's not to say that we are immune to Islamophobia. So last year we had a spate of attacks on masajid uh, and mosques in South Africa. When these attacks have happened, it hasn't been 
um, uh, in in the sense of what we've seen in New Zealand in Christchurch, etc. But each incident had a different reason, and each one of them was investigated separately and differently. There was either sectarian or criminal or Islamophobic acts behind it. But each one was dealt with in cooperation with the authorities. Even when it comes to the anti-halal uh, uh, movements, because we had an argument, I'm wrapping Sorry, up. Yeah, Just to give the examples that it is possible to do things differently. It is possible to work with legislation. It is possible to change the mindsets of people and governments. Uh, sister from CRT, please. This is yeah. This here. Yeah. No, no, no. There we go. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you uh, for the uh, chance. I would like to. <laughs> Actually, I'm also a sociologist and uh, I'm now interview producer at CRT World, but uh, my hat of sociology <laughs> um, I would like to comment on it and uh, add some, some comments. I have lots of friends from the women's circles. Uh, uh, one of them, she is now, um, uh, she's an uh, academic now. She's, uh, she managed to finish his, her degree in Istanbul University and uh, 10 years ago maybe. And uh, she, she asked me that whether I am now, a few days ago, whether I, I know a psychologist uh, who is a Muslim, I mean, uh, she's using a headscarf, by the way. But I, said, I asked her, what happened? Uh, what, what, for yourself, you, you wanted to so, so She said yes. Why, uh, she, she tried to, um, she said, I uh, visited Istanbul University building a couple of days ago, and all my memories from that corner, this, this garden, from this cafe, came to my mind, I, I really, would like to go attend a psychologist. Uh, why? Because it's she, because this headscarf bans at that time was uh, conducted by our regime and uh, she used to use hat wigs to enter into the building and now, although it passed now, uh, now these memories now disturbed her and she needed a, a psychologist. So what I'm now saying that the sociology, actually, a regime, very political move of the regimes or, or governments, creates psychology, creates psychological illness, sickness, and uh, not she's a individually. Uh, it's a it, it's a one example. Maybe there are lots of women who are now uh, because of this uh, move of the, some political agents. Mm -hmm. at the top yeah. of the uh, uh, societies, now they are suffering from psychological problems. Yeah, thank you. Absolutely. Yeah, thank you. the other one, the other one, may I have a, a, a couple of, a couple of. Oh, a couple. A couple, yes. <laughs> poor and being, poor and being, being, um, being rich, the relationship with, of, of Muslim, uh, Muslim being, Muslim individual, with the money, now it has been, question, uh, it has been a, uh, Question by the non-Muslims, if I may say, how at the beginning of the of this freedom of uh, freedom for the headscarf women, then all of a sudden in the social media people started to talk about uh, women with uh, with headscarf. They are using jib. Oh, what a what a uh, arms, but it, it's not a suitable for a Muslim woman to use to to have by using jib, which is very uh, expensive in Turkey. Uh, so they start, no one is asking a Christian woman or Jewish woman or non, uh, non whatever, atheist woman who is using jib and they are not questioning. Like going but to the gym the relationship, to exercise. Yeah, the, now, SUV. now the, the, what they are doing now, uh, people who are um, religious people who are uh, now their 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 children are growing up, and the children now is thinking that, oh, as a Muslim, my mom and my father, my my parents are now be getting more uh, in a, I mean they are making more money, so they are thinking that uh, they they I mean the um, how can I say rather than being poor I and mean, Muslim, 
supposed to be poor, not, even not to be, um, I mean, the relationship of Muslim agent uh, with the money has been always in the social media is, is has been questioned. And uh, you think, they, they are think they, they uh, I mean, they are questioning that, oh, you cannot be rich. Okay, so, so if, I just, if I could just uh, so, maybe uh, summarize your two uh, interventions. One is a question around uh, trauma of um, previously or very not being able to wear the headscarf. And the second one is around, as far as I understand it, um, uh, corruption uh, amongst uh, kind of the youth in terms of now seeing a kind of hyper capitalism amongst the religious classes. And the no, 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 it's no, not no. corruption. It has been. These women, although they are earning their money, they can have better jib or train or plane or she can have whatever she do. If they do not question the women without headscarf. I mean, I'm saying there is a not the headscarf policies, bare head, bare head policies of the regimes. There is a bare head policies. And another thing is. We We're out of things. This is what Ron does. He has to ask this question and we have to give the panel an opportunity so over time. Maybe half citizens being half citizens of uh, women with headscarf until the five years ago, uh, although the regime saying that 1934, uh, uh, these rights have been given to the citizens of Turkish people, but um, until the five years ago, Ravza Kavakçı, who is now MP in our parliament, even she was a little girl, had no uh, dream that when I was, uh, I mean, it's 64% uh, uh, of all adult women in Turkey using headscarf, but they had no dream that to be entering to the um, uh, parliament. So now they are now full citizen. They have, they used to only vote not to be voted, but now they are, they have the right to be voted. As a, they can they can dream that to be entered into uh, parliament, not not, not uh, as a par uh, parliament you. member. Thank you. Sorry, we really need to uh, uh, carry on, please. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. And just as well, Sorry, if you don't mind keeping your question very short. Actually, it's not a question. It's actually more of a comment. Okay. Oh, great. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, you guys have become the audience. Right. Uh, it's called the listening tour. Yeah. Uh, my, I want to say uh, something actually that I get more of critics. Right? It's actually Islamophobia. It's not. Uh, it's not. It's just a symptom and not the illness itself. And the illness is us being or stopping being good Muslims. So uh, I want to say that instead of focusing our, uh, instead of like putting our own focus, like the whole our focus onto educating other non-Muslims people, also uh, educate our uh, youth, or our young generations, uh, because. Uh, in my generation, I see uh, a lot of uh, young people that uh, Muslims by name, by, but embodying a lot of uh, Western ideas and even defending them. I'm, though I'm not saying that they're all like Western ideas are whole are uh, uh, bad, but I'm saying that uh, like there's uh, an identity crisis among us. Among, uh, yeah. So. Uh, that would be my comment. Instead of putting our own focus, the whole focus on educating others, we can Absolutely. also educate our young. That's what I appreciate that intervention. Okay. Yeah, we're going to talk about that. Are we ready? One more here, one more here. Awesome. Can I? Can I? Can I? Can I? Dude, we'll all miss our flights if I give you a chance. Yeah. <laughs> can, I, can I have a short question, please? Just a short question. Assalamu alaikum, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Abdullah here from SIGA. Uh, I just have a short question for Dr. Varsha. Uh, as far as from my own experience, uh, uh, India has a very complex religion. Uh, I don't know whether it's 100 or below or above. Uh, I was just wondering why everybody attacking or cares about the minority sort of stuff that we talk about in India is Muslims. Uh, on the other hand, we have very different, uh, in, I can call it like Indians, 
uh, with different uh, practice, way of practice of religion, someone practice animals, uh, plants, as far as I have seen. I'm sorry for the uh, academic words, uh, which I don't have it to use. So what would be your view, or point of view, or your uh, direction, or your reasoning behind that? How would you find it? Why, is it like only the external affecting to attack and, and diversify it towards the Islam, not others? Because like India is a very heterogeneous. And why? Why Islam? Why not others? Thank you. Yeah, we'll take this as last one, just to be fair. I don't know, just, uh, wait, 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 just, we'll just take this last one first. Uh, the problem is that I, had, I hadn't spoke, like, from today, so I, I just, can so, I have uh, some time? You want to make up for the last time? <laughs> 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 uh, you know what? You've been holding back. No, it's Sandy. Your conferences are amazing. Nobody wants to go home. Yeah. Yes, that's the point. Uh, so, alaikum. Uh, I'm Shayma Rumban from Tunisia. I'm student Sabah Design University. Uh, so, I'm so happy to participate in such conference. It was amazing. I was enjoying all the time uh, between the audience and the, the speakers, but my English wasn't that well to understand like word by word. But uh, maybe I get the, like the general uh, meanings. So um, I have just one comment about the the Islamophobics between Muslims. So I'm so happy that you uh, talked about this today because no one was talking about that. All everyone's talking about the non-Muslims uh, governments, how they uh, like mar marginalized Muslims. So um, I think. Uh, the, the Muslim government policies and our media frenzy has created a global negative opinion, of course, about Islam and Muslims. Uh, of course, I mean uh, Saudi Arabia, Emirates, Egypt, and plus. We are not doing politics, but it's a topic so related to politics, so there is no way. Uh, but uh, I just want to say, let's have a look for ourselves before. I mean, it's not even the governments, the normal people, we, we the Muslim people, because we have uh, such uh, a kind of uh, Islamophobia. Uh, in a way, we don't understand our religion, and maybe sometimes we make uh, a link between Islam and terrorism. I mean, terrorism. Um, and the way, for example, some Muslims, they are saying uh, our Islam, Isla the Islamic history is about blood and about wars and jihad and plus plus. So it's a misunderstanding for Islam and for Quran. Um, uh, and that's okay. So we, we need to raise our awareness about Islamophobia and about our religion. So when someone come and when we say Islam is not terrorist, Islam is peace, we need to have arguments about this. We need to explain this in which way Islam is peaceful. Um, so, it, fighting Islamophobia at the end, it will be uh, our responsibility, all of us, uh, and it will be a challenge, and it's not a small fit. At the end, I have small, uh, I for, for, it's not I like poetry, I like poetry. Um, it, it was um, perfectly executed by um, a group, and it's written by uh, Francisco, I think, Francisco, the poet Francisco. It's about Islamophobia. So, uh, on June 17, 2015, Dylan Rowe folded into midweek Bible study. He, he sat and prayed with the church member, members before pulling out his gun, killing most, and allowing one to leave. After the incident, he was found and arrested peacefully. When Dylan Roof killed nine innocent black people, we did, the, we did not question his gut. He wore flags of apartheid Africa. We did not question his allegiance. He committed the, the crime alone. We did not question his people. When Adam Lanza showed a classroom, classroom full of first graders at step at Sandy Hook Elementary, we did not ask him to leave the, the country. 
when Timothy McVeigh killed 168 people in Oklahoma, we did not call this a crime against every American. When the KKK killed thousands of black people while swung to hold Christian morality, we did not ask them to remove their robot. We do not call up the Christian bigots. Do you see it? How we don't label all white men based on the sins of the few? Do you see it? How we don't, how we don't have to, to condemn a whole class of people based on the action of the sun? Do you see it? How all the names are different, all the faces are different, all of the people are different, therefore we should not condemn all the Muslims for the radicalism of the group. If you want to, pers to persecute, if you want to persecute ISIS, go ahead, but to persecute ISIS is to persecute those who gave them power, and to persecute those who gave, gave them power is to persecute the U.S. government. Do your research. Islam is not synonymous with terror, it's literally submission, it's devotion, it's peace. And terrorism actually is forbidden, and jihad does not mean holy war, it means struggle, it means survival, it means standing face to face with everything that wants to put you on the ground and choosing to be alive. Do your research, stop listening to CNN, stop sharing humanity, humanity for hypocrisy. Stop staring at Muslims at the airport. Stop letting your fear drive your ignorance. Stop supporting billionaire Republican, Republicans who want to scare you to murder innocents. And stop supporting leaders who speak peace in native tongue. It's not the burning down the mosque, burn down the walls around the most muscles in your chest and realize that we all, we, we all have one. And lastly, as a customary greeting goes, Assalamu alaikum, peace be upon you, wa alaikum assalam, and be upon you be peace. Do you see? Thank you. Okay. With that, we're going to stop with the questions. Okay, thanks. Well recited. Well recited. This was a poem by someone else. Yeah. Right. Okay. Very good. Uh, yeah, I'm not going to comment on the poem. I don't think it's. Uh, it's not an endorse, you know, I didn't read, I didn't listen to all the words, so I can't fully endorse everything that was said, but uh, thank you for sharing that uh, with, with passion. So, do you have some questions? Uh, no, I think, I mean, we don't need to, uh, to address uh, comments. There's, there's some questions. Uh, well, I think what we should do, right, is, is uh, not to wrap up. Uh, she had one question directed at her. Because Abdullah has been no, running around amassing uh, stuff over here. So when he has a question, we need to answer it, right? Because he has done so much for all of us over here. So, um, yeah, Abdullah, I understand when you said there is so much of uh, varied faiths within India or within Hinduism, and if they could take in all that varied um, versions of Hinduism, then why why are they suddenly feeling so uh, hostile towards another religion, that is Islam? So I would say, um, as I mentioned in my paper, but maybe you were not here, so I'll again repeat that. Uh, it was part because there was a history of um, uh, Mughal empires in India, and how there was this sudden feeling like, okay, we don't have power anymore in different states in India where, where it was Mughal rule, they suddenly felt uh, uh, threatened. So that was one immediate reason for hostilities beginning within India, between these two communities particularly. But then it changed, right? It never remained static that there was a Muslim rule forever, or then the, the Hindus were not kings uh, anymore. So when it changed, what happened is the ruling class always remained the ruling class. But then uh, the, the significant population, whether it is Hindus or Muslims, they are poor. They, they live in abject poverty. And it, it ultimately comes to livelihood. When it, when it becomes a question of livelihood, uh, resources, about jobs, about looking up, uh, after your family, that is a, a position wherein, um, like in America, the politicians could use it to, to play it as us against them. So if they are going to get the better jobs, then you are going to um, be deprived of something. 
So this played well into the uh, political agenda, wherein we can see some of the riots I spoke of. There were economical reasons too. Before these riots, it was there were job layoffs from different mills closing up. So these job layoffs uh, put uh, some of the Hindu workers, nearly 70,000 of them, out of their jobs. But the Muslims didn't go out of jobs in that part because they were skilled in, um, in uh, stitching labor. So suddenly, that became a right point. So at different points in history, we can see it was not singularly about um, Islam as a religion, but what this Muslim might take away from me. It was when it comes to the, the, the larger population. And, but then these bigger riots, how they work out is uh, to, to go into massacres, to go into pogrom, that was whipped up with religious passion. So that, that would be a very short answer to the question. Thank you, Roshan. Appreciate that. Um, you want to do one minute each, or do you want to just wrap up yourself? I think because we're already 15 minutes over. Yeah, I think uh, maybe if you. Sorry? Yeah, so why don't you take that time? Thank you so minutes much. From yourself. So number four there, at its essence, is racism. And one way to counter Islamophobia is for each one of us to rid themselves, ourselves, of any racist attitudes, feelings, behavior, any thoughts. Uh, I have no doubt each one of us has some sort of that. So one thing to contribute against it is to see if we have these and how we can deal with that. When you look at the big problem like Islamophobia, we find it very difficult to deal with. So what we have to do is to break it up in smaller problems. Then you have this smaller problem and you still, how can I deal with it? Then you break it up into more and more until you find something that you can actually deal with. And that's how we can contribute against Islamophobia. Uh, in my remarks previous, I said about education and action. Education we tried to do here in this conference. Thankfully, we had wonderful speakers that they really attributed in different <coughs> panels, uh, in different topics and different subjects. And, and the way it was, it was uh, dealt with, the way it was presented, was, was excellent, wonderful, and we really appreciate their contributions. When it comes to action, that becomes your part, because actions at the end come from human beings or on the ground. Uh, we come from different countries, you know, I thought we come from a dozen, seems to be even more than a dozen countries. When we, back, when we go back home, try to see how we can contribute against racism, against Islamophobia, xenophobia, all kinds of phobias that people have, but also affect other people's lives. I want to thank you for coming, thank you for staying and sticking uh, with us until the end. Uh, thank you very much for the, for the uh, wonderful speakers we had here today. I want to thank our staff. <laughs> our staff and volunteers, please stand up. These are the uh, soldiers behind me. Thank you very much for all your contributions, all your sacrifices. We we'll also thank our sponsors, our uh, contributors, as well as uh, our school here, and uh, and all of you for being here. And I hope to see you next year. <laughs> On the final note, in two weeks we're going to repeat. <laughs> exactly two weeks, uh, actually uh, two weeks from yesterday, uh, on the 27th to 29th, we have a, our uh, another uh, big conference on Palestine. So there will be also another uh, uh, about 30 speakers or so. This is going to be a big time. Hope to see you there. Thank you so much. Salam alaikum.
what? Cap? Oh, these dudes. Ben şunu hala. 